Hello everybody, I'm Nickel. Welcome to another episode of CodeCop, the series where we go over bad advice found on places like LinkedIn, Twitter or blogs and we try to learn from it and turn it into good advice. Now in this video we have a bit of a first because even though we are sticking with LinkedIn which is a terrible place to get advice in .NET specifically, we have a LinkedIn newsletter, not a LinkedIn post, so it's a bit lengthier. The title of this newsletter is 10 tips to write better and cleaner c -sharp code. However, a bit of a spoiler, Five out of those 10 tips are really bad or just wrong. So in this video, we're going to see what those are, why they're bad and how you should be doing things, in my opinion. If you like the book content and you want to see more, make sure you subscribe for more training. Check out my courses on dometrain.com. Okay, so I've broken down every single one of those bad ones into images. So let's go on the first one. Choosing the right data types. Mistake. Developers sometimes default into using types like list of object. I have... Never in my many years career with C Sharp, I have never seen anyone write list of object unless they have a very specific reason to do so, especially if they use a list. No one would use an object. And I'll tell you why in a second, but let's see the solution. Select the most appropriate data type to avoid unnecessary boxing and unboxing operations. This is true. If you use an object, you're going to end up with boxing and unboxing. And this is particularly a problem with value types because value types normally get allocated on the stack. However, if you turn them into an object, you're going to box them and that will make them a reference type. And that reference type, which is the box, will be allocated on the heap, which is garbage collected, which leads into micro pauses, which leads into performance issues. So we continue here, for instance, using list of string instead of list of object when dealing with strings. Now let's go to the ID and technically there is value on you know this piece of advice. But like I said, nobody really does this because if you had a list of objects, let's say objects over here and then a list of strings, let's say strings. First, write in the comments down below, have you ever, ever used a list of objects? where the reason isn't that you just don't know what type is going to be in there and you just need a list of objects because, well, it's going to catch any type you throw at it because I have never done it. And actually, C Sharp has a bit of a type for list of objects. It's called an array list. An array list in C Sharp is, as you're going to see inside the type, effectively a list of objects. It is an array of objects with list capabilities. So it will store items into an object array, which by the way, the list will do as well. If we go here, you're going to see a list is backed by an array, but in this case, it's a generic type T and using a generic type prevents boxing, hence it's more performant. So the only time I've seen array list, which is a list of objects, is in very, very old C sharp code when we didn't have generics like C sharp one and even that was just for a curiosity, you know, what did C Sharp 1 code look like? That's when I stumbled across this type of thing. This advice is a bit of a known advice. That's why I'm including it. Don't be tricked to think that this is something that has a reason to exist. It doesn't. Bad advice. Now, before I move on, I'd like to let you know that we just launched a brand new course on Dome Train called Deep Dive into Microservices Architecture. And it is a follow up on the existing Getting Started with Microservice Architecture by AWS Solution Architect. James Istam. In this course, James goes really in depth into microservice architecture and he builds an entire system for you. So there's code, there's diagrams, there's explanations, there's so, so much packed into four and a half hours. It's a unique opportunity to learn from someone who builds those types of things for a company as big as AWS. And it is an amazing opportunity to dive into this topic because until the 20th of May, everyone who gets the deep dive course will also get the getting started course for free. You don't need to add it into your basket. Just purchase the deep dive course on microservice architecture and the getting started course will automatically appear. Do not miss this opportunity. Now back to the video. Then you have optimizing loops. Now I've made videos about loop performance. And if you've seen my previous video on loop performance, you know why this is wrong. But let's take a look here. We have mistake. Iterating through collections using for each can lead to performance bottlenecks. Bottleneck is a very strong word. Never use it unless you know exactly what you're talking about. This will not bottleneck you basically ever in 99.999% of circumstances. And that's mathematically accurate when the collection 
is large. Solution, consider using for loops, especially when dealing with arrays. This can enhance performance by avoiding the overhead associated with iterators. Well, let's take a look at that. I have this loop performance benchmark over here, and let's just hide the necessary columns. Um, and I have a list of strings. Now, lists tend to perform worse when it comes to loops, but since the post said uh, arrays, what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn this into an array. Now, I can't say add random. So what I'm going to do instead over here is I'm going to initialize this as an array with a million items over here. So let's just turn this into a const of type int and use the size here. Maybe push this here. That does look better. Rename this to size. Here we go. And then we're just going to set each item in here to that value. So we're going to say i equals that here we go. Now we're using a seed with a random number here, and that allows us to have deterministic results on every execution of this list. And then we have our benchmarks where we are storing also the size because this can improve performance a bit. So here we go. We have the array, we have all the values, we set all the values, and then we are iterating over them and we're getting the effectively the last item. So we go through the entire array and we're doing this so this is not optimized the way. So let's go ahead into the program.cs say benchmark runner run and then loop performance let's turn this into release mode actually it is and just run it and let's see what we get back okay so results are back and let's see what we have here so as you can see it's basically the same performance in fact in this case and again this is within margin of error but for each is a bit faster than four that's because dotnet over the years has been optimized these things will just by default try to use spans and optimize as much as possible and this is a million items in this array. So just don't worry about it. Like we have looping figured out. There's not much you can do to make it much faster without making it unsafe. Next, we have exception handling overhead mistake. Excessive use of exceptions for control flow can hinder performance. And that is true. The reason why I included this advice in this video, even though it's actually good advice in general, is because the way it is presented, especially if you don't read the text, which, okay, you should have read the text, but if you don't read the text, you will assume that you should remove try catch from your application and just have if conditions. Things that you use within your logic or outside of your logic can still throw exceptions. So if you know something can be thrown by the BCL, by something else, by something you do not control, you should still use try catch. Yes, there is some performance Hit, but in .NET 9, we're getting faster exceptions. And even then, it's not something you should be thinking. Write safe code and in general code defensively. And yeah, I prefer result types like this, which they are not really mentioned. What we have here is reserve exceptions for exceptional situations, which I agree. Use conditional statements for expected behavior to avoid unnecessary overhead. This can be true, but the overhead shouldn't really be the reason. I think you're going to end up with better code if you have predictable flow on your application's runtime. What I mean by that is that if you throw an exception here and this exception is caught in the middleware, this is as good as having go to in your application, which by the way, go to is a valid thing you can do in C sharp because you're saying going from here somewhere completely outside of any predictable flow of the application. So this should not be a do not use exceptions because of handling overhead. Don't use exceptions for control flow. I agree, but still care for them, still have those catch clauses in case something happens. This is not bad advice, but it is unclear advice. Then we have six, async await best practices. Overusing async await without understanding its implications can lead to thread pool exhaustion. Technically true, technically it can happen. Realistically, nothing you should worry about. It is insane to even use that as an argument. Solution, use await async carefully, avoid making methods async if they don't have to, and consider configure await false to prevent deadlocks in your applications. But this is the code. So you have async method, async await, and just goes into another async method. So you just say return that method. So you just say return await that operation while here you don't. Now, the second one will actually perform faster because it doesn't have to generate an await async state machine. So there's a performance benefit in doing that. The countering of that is that you're losing part of the stack trace. A prime example of something like this is if you use something like the HTTP 
client. If you go in the HTTP client, and in fact, I shouldn't go there, I should say client equals and then client dot um, get async. If I do something like that and I go to the get async method, you'll see that the task method here is calling, it is forwarding over here to another get async method and that get async method to another get async method and then that into another. None of these are using async await even though they could. That is because, well, they don't have to. Even here, they don't do this because there's no benefit on preserving the stack trace for something like this compared to how much you might use HTTP client and how much performance you can gain. You're not losing out on much, but the core call over here that has a more complicated call flow with calling the load into buffer async, that does have async await, but here we don't. Here we could, because this is, as you can see over here, async awaitable, but we don't await it. This, however, is async, and then it is awaited. So you have to pick and choose if having async await in a method call makes sense for you. So there is some truth to that, but the reason is not the thread pool exhaustion. And also there's a bit of a debate on this topic because David Fowler, who's basically God, he has written in his ASP.NET Core Diagnostic Scenarios post, which I'm going to put in the description down below in case you want to read it, has tons of advice about ASP.NET Core. He has said, prefer async await over directly returning tasks. There are benefits to using async await uh, instead of returning directly the tasks. You can read that if you want to. And there are performance considerations as he makes a point about. But ultimately, you have to understand why you're using it or why you're not using it. It's not just use it or don't use it. And the thread pool exhaustion issue should never be something you ever have to worry about because the whole point of await async is it's abstracting threads for you and you don't have to even care about their existence. Bad advice, just don't. Next one is proper resource disposal. Mistake, neglecting to dispose resources explicitly such as database or file streams. Solutions, implement the iDisposable interface or use the using statement to ensure proper resource cleanup. The reason why this is a mistake, the SQL connection thing, is for no other reason other than deliberately not calling the right method. For example, if your whole point of using a SQL connection and after using it, uh, closing it, is to actually dispose it, then the equivalent of this would have been SQL connection dot dispose. And actually, if you want to get super technical, it is more of a if it is null, then dispose. Uh, and the reason for that is because if you use using and then you pass a var and you do something here, all the using keyword will do if we take a look at the code behind the scenes is, as you can see over here, introduce a try finally, and in the finally block, you just call dispose. There is no SQL connection close call. Inside the dispose method of each SQL connection, there might be a SQL connection close call, but that is not the point of disposing the connection. This is just about closing the connection. You might reopen it. There's many things you can do. If you actually want to dispose it, just call dispose or use a using statement. It's simple as that. It has nothing to do with using using statement to properly dispose them. It does nothing more than calling the dispose method. That's it. There's no magic to it. It's just a fancy wrapper so you don't have to write try finally. The compiler does it for you. That's it. Bad advice or unclear advice. And that's it. Five pieces of advice you should not follow or if you are to follow, follow them for the right reasons. Having a bad understanding or advice you follow can lead you to make worse decisions on other adjacent topics. So that's why I'm making this video. But now I want to know from you, what are some tips of advice you have for everyone in the comments down below? Things you should not be doing and give a good explanation, please. I really want to know. And if it's something really, really good, I'll put it in a video. Well, that's all I have for you for this video. Thank you very much for watching. And as always, keep coding.